We have over 50 um, reservations for today's event. So I think we've set a record and um, we'll just take one more. Uh, well, actually, I think we'll, we'll get started because we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So um, Rhonda is going to, there you go. Now we'll be able to see everybody easily. Um, and um, I want to, I'm Michelle Siegel. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Relations at Rackham. And I also have the good fortune to um, do international travel. So I've had the opportunity to meet some of the Barber Scholars in their home countries and others um, in Ann Arbor. And I want to welcome everybody personally to our celebration and thank you for taking the time to honor our exceptional Rackham students. We have um, students with us today, faculty, family, friends, and Barber alumni from across the country and around the world. And in a few, minute, few moments, we'll hear from Rackham Dean Mike Solomon, who will give a little bit of history and talk about the significance of the Barber Scholarship, as well as providing a brief campus update. Um, then we'll hear from Barber, Barber alumna Sheila Chung, who will bring greetings on behalf of the Barber alumna. And she will, um, after she speaks, she'll meet each of our eight new Barber scholars. And later we will be breaking out into small group discussions. So you can greet our scholars, congratulate them and ask a few questions. Um, before we begin, I just wanna ask everybody to make sure that if you're not speaking, you're muted. And if you haven't already, make sure that your name is um, appearing on the screen, first and last name in English. It'll help quite a bit when we go into the breakout rooms. And now I'm delighted to introduce Rackham Dean and Vice Provost for Graduate Education, Mike Solomon. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike, to begin your remarks. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. And uh, along with Michelle, it's it's my great pleasure to be with you all today um, as we honor uh, the exceptional Rackham students with us. Um, it's just wonderful that we have members of the Barber community here um, from Ann Arbor, across the United States and around the world. And it really speaks to the power and prestige of the Barber Scholarship. The Graduate School is really proud to administer this important award and be part of the diverse and dynamic community of women who have received the Barber Scholarship I want to acknowledge in particular the departments and faculty advisors who nominated students for the scholarships, as well as the selection committees for their work, which resulted in an outstanding cohort of Barber scholars for the upcoming academic year that we have the pleasure to honor tonight. I also want to take a moment to thank family, friends, and faculty advisors who are here with us tonight uh, for the and for the important role that you play uh, in the work and achievement of these scholars. 2021 marks the 104th anniversary of Levi Barber's gift to endow the Barber Scholarship. It makes it one of the oldest scholarship programs at the University of Michigan. The story of the scholars began when Barber, a prominent Detroit lawyer, real estate developer, and philanthropist, also a Michigan alum and regent, traveled to Asia in 1913. During his trip, Barber met three women in China and Japan who had been trained in medicine at the University of Michigan. Inspired by their remarkable contributions to those countries' welfare and development, he cultivated a vision to endow a scholarship to prepare Asian women as leaders in their home countries and to facilitate understanding among cultures. Barbara wanted to support the opportunity for more women to receive an education and carry out the same mission at the University of Michigan. Much has changed since the scholarship's origination in 1914, but the continuing thread that we focus and honor today are the capabilities, agency, and accomplishments of the Barber Scholars, extending over a period of more than 100 years. There have now been more than 700 Barber Scholars representing deep excellence in graduate education at Michigan. These scholars help to foster global academic exchange, access to education for students in underrepresented fields. The Barber alums have played important roles in the political, educational, industrial, and social development of institutions around the world. Before I close these brief remarks, I'd like to take a moment to share a few updates on Michigan, our return to campus, um, particularly as it's impacting our Rackham students. 
you all know, likely know that the fall term is underway. It's been wonderful to see students back on campus and have the opportunity to, to speak and engage with them. The university has required that all faculty, staff, and students be vaccinated against COVID, and we continue to have a guarded sense of optimism for this academic year in Ann Arbor, though ready for um, the uncertainty and, and what, what, what uh, this continuing pandemic will bring us. Now, focusing on Rackham for a moment, we are continuing to explore ideas about how to transform graduate education and the graduate student experience in new and substantive ways. I'd like to share uh, tonight just a few projects that are on the front burner for us in the next year. First, it has become increasingly clear that graduate training requires more than just exceptional academic preparation and research. For this reason, Rackham is pursuing an important shift in how doctoral students are trained and prepared for their careers through our launch of a new Rackham doctoral internship program which will provide experiential learning opportunities for doctoral students that extend beyond our campus. In addition, the Barber Scholarship is one example of Rackham's longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. To further those efforts, we have embarked on a process of reevaluating re how graduate education is accessed and experienced at the university. Key to that, realizing that vision, is investing in inclusive and student-centered climates in which all students thrive. To that end, Rackham is conducting a campus-wide discussion about admissions practices and doctoral education in the coming year, including an evaluation of a proposal to end the use of the graduate record examination and doctoral admissions. It is also reinforcing a positive culture that supports the many different facets of diversity that make us excellent through our efforts like our DNI Professional Development Certificate Program that enrolls more than 100 students every year. This is all in service of the graduate students, a graduate schools a commitment to an environment in which students thrive. And finally, we know that mental health and well being has direct consequences for the academic success of our graduate students. And therefore, it needs the continuous attention of Rackham programs, staff, and faculty. One significant step I mentioned today is the creation of the Rackham Committee on Graduate Student Mental Health and Well Being. It's a new standing committee that will include a mix of students, faculty, and professional staff. It will be a source of knowledge and practice to help Rackham and graduate programs provide support for student mental health and well being at the University of Michigan. So that's a brief update. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Sheila Chong, who came to the University of Michigan to pursue her MBA in 1976. Sheila was grateful to receive the Barber Scholarship in 1977. And upon graduation, Sheila returned to her native Hong Kong to work for ExxonMobil. Over her career, she worked in many different uh, capacities, including as treasurer of the company's Asia Pacific division. Sheila brings greetings today on behalf of the Barber alumni. Sheila, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Ian Solomon. Um, well, first of all, it's an honor for me to be joining this uh, very celebratory event. Um, as Dean said, I was doing my MBA at the business school and I had the tuition scholarship for the first year. And when I was wondering how I would manage for the second year, that's when I was informed of the Barber scholarship. Now I realized that with that background today, I would not be eligible for the Barber scholarship which makes me even more grateful that I actually had the opportunity of being a Barber Scholar. And as Dean said, um, after graduation, I uh, joined ExxonMobil and pursued a career in finance, marketing, project management. I retired from my corporate career and now spend a fair bit of my time on volunteer work, mostly with churches and the NGOs and mentoring of young people. And as um, I forgot to mention, uh, the time when I got the Barber Scholarship, which was a long time ago before many of you were born, um, there was no particular effort to bring the scholars together. And I don't remember meeting anyone, uh, any other Barber Scholars until the summer of 2019 when Dean Solomon and Michelle came to Hong Kong, they organized a uh, breakfast with other Barber scholars in the region. 
And I, I think that was the first time I actually met with fellow Baba scholars. But the meeting actually prompted me to reflect on two things. Um, one is what a remarkable thing Mr. Baba actually did, setting up this foundation to help educate women in a part of the world that's very far from his own. If over a hundred years old, ago, a man who can do that for an un, sort of unrelated group, minority group, so sort of what more or what should we as beneficiaries of his vision should or can do when we are in a position to do so to help others? And the second part is also, as mentioned, um, the scholarship is much more than the financial support, which was what I initially only focused on. But with so many scholars over the years around the world, we are a community. And as a community, um, we can do more than what an individual can do to help each other and to help others. I mean, ironically, the pandemic while making it hard to travel, but by adapting te technology, we have all learned to connect virtually. I mean, today's event, if we take an in-person, which would be lovely, but would only allow those in Ann Arbor to attend. But now we have participants from multiple locations. Um, recently, Michelle organized an online discussion of Barber scholars from sort of different generations. And it is clear, um, and I quote from her notes, there's a deep appreciation for the Barber scholarship and a strong desire to further the Barber legacy through networking, service, participation, and support. I mean, the ideas we shared as a group include, you know, sharing contacts, just getting to know each other, connections by professional groups or geographical locations, my personal favorite is for the community to share life experiences. Even with all the progress made, women still face many, unfortunately, many of the same issues faced by previous generations in our professional and family lives. And it would be helpful to find out how others have managed. So with that, my big congratulations and welcome to this year's Barber Scholars, not only for your achievements and recognition on being recipients of the scholarship, but also for the fact that you are now part of a community, a unique community who will carry on the legacy of Barber. And with this, I would like to introduce our first scholar for this year, and help me if I didn't get your name right. Is it Felici May Peach Arena? Yes, that, that's correct. <laughs> okay. And she's going to share with us about her research. Thank you, Sheila. So, hello, everyone. Um, I am Peach Arenas, a PhD student in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. So to talk about my research, I first would like to invite you to imagine your home and all the stuff that you keep but no longer use. So your broken TV, your clothes from 10 years ago that no longer fit, even all the questionable leftovers you have in your refrigerator right now. So all of these are junk and take up space in our lives and cause stress. Did you know that our bodies also have the same junk and clutter? If there's too much junk in our bodies, we can get really sick. But thankfully, the cells in our body are very good in decluttering and taking out their trash. So our body is composed of cells and cells make proteins to do many different functions. When these proteins are no longer useful, they have to be destroyed. Otherwise, they can become too many, they lose their function, or they become too old and expire. All of these are toxic to the cell. Thankfully, cells have special enzymes that we'll simply call decluttering enzymes, or E3 ubiquitin ligases, if you want to be specific. 
These enzymes act like a surveillance system, looking out for junk proteins all the time. Once these decluttering enzymes identify these bad proteins, they attach a signal that tells the, that tells the cell to start destroying these proteins before they can do harm. Now let's step back a little bit. I want you to remember that time you were cleaning up the junk in your house. How did you know which things to keep and which ones to throw out? If it was food, you probably checked the expiry date, you checked for discoloration, and you sm or you smelled it. If you're familiar with Marie Kondo, you probably checked which one sparked joy. Now let's go back to the cell. Unfortunately, decluttering enzymes cannot read, see, smell, or sense joy. How then can they know which proteins to eliminate? In my research, I use genetics, biochemistry, and computer modeling to answer this question. What I found is that these enzymes actually rely on shape. You see, proteins are like molecular puzzle pieces. They have to fit, fit into each other to interact. What I found is that these proteins have a certain shape. I don't know if you can see it. They have a certain shape when they are functional but then they become misshapen when they are starting to go bad. What's fascinating is that these pro as these proteins change shape, they become more attractive to the decluttering enzymes, making them susceptible for degradation. So for my final year of PhD, I am working on learning how to use a powerful electron microscope to take pictures of these proteins' actual shapes at the molecular level. Now, why is this all important? As I mentioned earlier, having too many junk proteins is harmful to the cell. In some cases, they can even cause disease such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Cancer cells, on the other hand, take advantage of this and overproduce proteins that deactivate anti-cancer drugs, making them very hard to treat. Lastly, Viruses can overproduce proteins that make them more effective in inf infecting human cells. One such protein is the spike protein on the coronavirus, which unfortunately keeps mutating. If we can fully understand how cells naturally declutter and degrade harmful proteins, then maybe we can harness this knowledge to design new therapies and drugs. We can make decluttering enzymes more efficient in clearing out junk proteins, or we can make better puzzle pieces that can target proteins that are causing disease. So the next time you clean out the junk from your house, I hope you stop and appreciate how cells declutter themselves to keep us healthy. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then I would like to... Um, hand over the stage to my colleague, uh, Sidja Gang. Uh, thank you, Peach. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sidja from Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. I'm advised by Professor Ian Hiskins, and my dissertation research aims to make power grids more sustainable by increasing renewable resources while ensuring system safety and stability. Electricity has been something we take for granted in modern life. But have you ever wondered about why every time you turn on the lights, the electricity always immediately comes to you? The electricity generated from a power plant, usually located far away, makes its journey to your home almost instantaneously through the power grid. The fundamental operating principle of power grid is that the electricity generated by the uh, power plants match the electricity consumed by the users simultaneously. That is, the supply has to be equal to the demand second to second. Traditionally, those power plants that we talked about earlier are large generators based on fossil fuels. They are reliable, they are fully controllable, but they are not eco-friendly. Recently, power grids are drastically evolving from fossil fuel-based power plants to renewable resources such as wind and solar. However, is our current grid infrastructure really ready to cope with such change? First, 
renewable resources are intrinsically variable and uncertain. The generation from solar panels could drop from maximum to zero within seconds due to the shading caused by clouds. The fast fluctuations of wind speed will affect the generation from wind turbine accordingly. This all poses great challenges for the system operators since recall that the generation has to be matched to the load. Second, compared to the traditional power plants, renewable resources are typically small in capacity and are deployed in a distributed way. For example, there are more and more rooftop solar panels installed in our community. This renders millions of control points. The current energy management system is not capable to handle the problems at such scale. To ensure safety and stability of power grids, it's imperative that we rigorously solve these technical challenges. In my research, I developed an analysis method to review the impacts of uncertainties on power systems. The uncertain uh, the uncertainties from renewable resources are modeled as external disturbance to the system. Under this disturbance, the system could show a range of possible behaviors, and we want to know exactly how large this range could be. I creatively combined the trajectory sensitivity method and the mathematical tool of logarithmic norm to quantify this range. This method greatly improves both the efficiency and accuracy compared to the widely used flow pipe method. Furthermore, to tackle the control problem for distributed renewable resources, I developed a novel decentralized controller, which guarantees safety while stabilizes the system. Simply speaking, safety means that the system never operates in those unsafe regions in state space. The proposed controller exploits barrier function. As its name suggested, it forms a guardrail against the unsafe region. And our controller is novel in that it only requires local measurement, which is easier to implement and avoids the communication requirements. With these new developments, hopefully we can improve our current capability of integrating renewable resources. I hope my talk has shed some lights on the current transformation in power grids and envision that in the future, the power system will become more sustainable and we can keep our lights on while keeping our planet healthy. This concludes my talk. Next, I will hand over to Yu Cong. Thanks. Sure. Um, thank you, staff, for your wonderful presentation and also for your introduction. Um, my name is Yu Cong. I am a doctor candidate from um, the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. I'm currently at the final stage of completing my dissertation, which examines the transnational origins and intermedial making of uh, Chinese auditory culture or um, culture of sound from the onset of the second Sino-Japanese War to um, the end of the Cultural Revolution. The four decades from 1937 to 1966 that my research covers witnessed the advent of the age of sound was the global dissemination of media infrastructure, which propelled a paradigmatic shift in cultural production from print culture to sound media. The period further corresponds to the most tumultuous age in modern Chinese history of intensely fought hot wars and global cold war, national revolutions and the cultural revolution. Together, some technologies and revolutionary upheavals informed a distinctive mode of sounding and listening that I theorize in my dissertation as acoustics of crisis. This concept illuminates the expressive and affective potentials of sound in response to the cultural, political, and perceptual crisis from which individual and national identities were formulated anew. Every time I introduce my research, um, I will always come across um, 
um, I will always come across curious questions um, such as um, how do you understand sound or in what ways can you study sound when it is so ephemeral and intangible? In existing humanist humanistic research, scholars tend to um, understand sound metaphorically as the artistic expression of individual subjectivity or a communal identity. However, in my research, I move beyond this prevalent analytical framework that focuses almost exclusively on the representation of sound in literature and visual culture and understand sound instead as sound expressions and networks of resonance. Sound expressions I propose uh, entail a rough range of mediums popular in mid 20th century China that possess a distinctive sonic quality such as recitation poetry, musical cinema, and intermediate theater, in which artist, artists laboriously experimented with the expressive expressivity of sound to agitate the spectators in crisis-ridden times. Networks of resonance highlight the transnational dissemination of media infrastructure and heterogeneous listening practices therein, which I argue, effectively spread political messages of national and world revolutions and cultivated um, sensibilities of uncommunal and international solidarity. I see my research um, as contributing to um, the following two areas, media and sound studies in the global south on the one hand, and the cultural history of transnationalism in mid 20th century China on the other. Um, first, um, much of the existing vocabulary of uh, media and sound studies is, premise, is premised upon the history of capitalist media modernity in Europe America, where sounding and listening are often associated with domesticity and interiority. However, my research narrates a story of the intersection between sonic revolutions and political revolutions in the global south with the case study of modern China. And it showcases the heterogeneous use of some technologies and the media aesthetics in a broader process of decolonization. And secondly, um, I study the making of Chinese sound culture against a series of um, transnational networks, such as the anti fascist international, the decolonizing movements of the global south and the cultural history of Cold War in Asia. These circuits of inter-Asian and intercontinental exchanges um, illuminate the polycentric circulation of acoustic aesthetics across vast geographical spaces and bring to light contending articulations of nationalism, cosmopolitanism, and internationalism in 20th century China and beyond. And now it is uh, my honor to um, introduce um, the next Weber scholar um, this year, um, Patata Lawani from the Department of um, Psychology. Thank you, Yukong. Um, it is a great honor and a privilege to be a part of the rich legacy of Baba scholars and community. Uh, I am Pustata Lalwani, and you can just remember me as Pia because that's easier. Uh, I am a PhD student in the Department of Psychology in the Cognition and Cognitive Neuroscience area. My research primarily focuses on understanding how and why the brain and cognition changes with aging. I don't think I need to motivate why it is important to understand cognitive aging, as some of us might already be experiencing and we've all seen our grandparents. As we age, we tend to become a little more forgetful, we get distracted more easily, we can't process information quite as quickly. Why is that? My research investigates two neural measures, neural distinctiveness and brain signal variability that change with age and underlie some of these behavioral impairments. We hope that understanding these neural changes might help us in our efforts to ameliorate some of the age-related cognitive impairments. Let me tell you briefly today about one of these measures, neural distinctiveness, and I'm happy to discuss more about brain signal variability in our breakout session. So remember the last time your neighbor's dog had puppies, how hard it was to tell them apart? That is because they look so similar. So the representations of these puppies in your brain are also extremely similar. On the other hand, it is really easy to tell apart your shoe from your ring because everything about them is different, right? So the material, the shape, the size, everything. Your brain 
represents these items quite differently. And using fMRI, a neuroimaging method, we can measure the brain activity while participants are viewing, hearing these different stimulus. So when you see a face, for example, it activates the specific region in your brain that represents the face. Thus, the brain activity on seeing faces is obviously gonna be very different or distinct than the brain activity when seeing houses in healthy young adults. However, the, however, with age, the neural responses start becoming less unique or distinct. It is no surprise that my grandmother um, confuses me with my sibling. Um, that is not to say that older adults are now confusing faces and houses, but it's that the brain activity patterns are less separable, they're more similar, they're less distinct than they were amongst young. So we then investigated whether this decline in distinctiveness was unique to the visual system. Is it just about viewing faces and houses or is this true of other regions of the brain? What causes this? We found that this might be generally true of the brain. Specifically, we found that in the auditory system, brain activity on listening to speech and music is more confusable or less distinct with it. Moreover, those older adults who had more confusable patterns were also the ones who performed worse on a bunch of behavior measures like memory and speed of processing. There are some older adults whose performance and activity patterns are just as good, if not better than healthy young adults. And since we all want to be like those gracefully aging individuals, it is really important to understand what makes them different and why distinctiveness declines in the first place. When we see a face, a part of our brain that represents the face is active, but it also suppresses all other regions in the brain that are representing say a shoe or a house, et cetera. We hypothesize this ability to suppress other irrelevant regions and the information in the brain is what is compromised in aging. Consistent with this, we found that brain's major inhibitory neurochemical is indeed reduced with aging. And interestingly, the lower the inhibitory content, the less distinct the activity patterns are in the brain. So together, these results suggest that interventions targeting the brain's inhibitory system are a promising research direction to pursue in our efforts to ameliorate age-related cognitive empire, uh, impairments. With that promise, let me pass the mic to Sharmi Sain, who is our next Power Scholar. Thank you, Pia. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sharmi Sain, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the Department of Anthropology. As a biological anthropologist, I am broadly interested in the evolution of social behaviors and how social relationships can help animals survive and adapt to different environments. My research focuses primarily on non-human primates as they are our closest relatives and they have been a focus of anthropological studies since the 1960s. And the field of primatology, unlike any other discipline, was pioneered by women like Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey. So that was another reason why I was really drawn to this field. Currently, I am studying gelada monkeys that are native to the highlands of Ethiopia as a part of a long-term research team that was put together by my advisor, Dr. Jacinta Beener, since 2006. My dissertation explores how and why do male gelada monkeys show contrasting behavioral strategies spanning from high levels of cooperation to conflict. I will be also looking at how each of these strategies differ in terms of their reproductive payoffs and net benefits to the individuals. I take a three-pronged approach in my research where, where I incorporate hormones, behavioral observations, and genetic methods to answer questions related to the behavioral ecology of these monkeys and how these individual monkeys are doing throughout their lifetime with changing environments. I hope by studying geladas as a model system, I will be able to answer questions about the evolution of sociality in humans and also understand how social relationships help us stay healthy and survive in the long run. I am con currently conducting the final stages of lab work to collect all the data for finishing up my dissertation. After completing my PhD, I wish to pursue a career in ac academia, and I hope one day to establish a field site in India studying different species of non-human primates and conducting long-term research on their social behaviors, physiology, and life history. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank some people. I would not be here if it were not for my family and their sacrifices, including today. They are up at 4.30 a.m. and attending this event. Uh, I'm especially grateful also to my mother for her continued faith in me. Uh, I would also thank, like to thank my partner and friends at the university for supporting me and to all the wonderful mentors that I've had here who have helped me grow as a researcher and continue to support me here at the university. None of the research that I do would be possible without the support from Rackham, and I feel incredibly lucky to be selected as a Barber Fellow, and I hope I, that I do justice to the legacy of Barber Scholars. Thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you to all the Rackham organizers for putting this event together. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my fellow Barber Scholar, Shi Wang. Thank you, Sharmi. Hello everyone, I'm Xi Wang and I'm a fourth year PhD student in civil engineering. I work with Professor Carol Manasa and Professor Vinit Kamat on construction robotics. Construction has a high, higher number of fatalities and non-fatal injury rates among all the industries. While automation and robotics play a role in other industries like manufacturing, the construction industry is still manual and labor intensive. This is because the very nature of construction is challenging for robot adoption. If you imagine robot on a factory assembly line, the products move to the robot and the robots repeat the motion again and again. Moreover, the construction site is very dynamic and unstructured with moving workers, equipment, and materials placing here and there. The tolerance is also loose, so the materials and the place where they finally installed might not be exactly where it is designed. Uh, so these uncertainties, well, human workers can handle it well. It is very difficult for robot to handle with its current cognitive capacities. So in my research, instead of letting robot replace human, I let them work together. Humans can do the high level task planning and handle uncertainties, just like a manager. And the robot, like the assistant, can perform physical work they can do it quickly and precisely like better than human. They can, uh, they can also perform low level trajectory planning with their sensors and do the uh, calculations and computation more faster than human. With this in mind, I created a collaborative human robot cl collaboration system. In this system, I created a digital twin for the construction site and the robot in an immersive VR environment for the human workers to interact with the robot remotely in a safer workplace other than the construction site. And there are sensors like cameras installed on the construction site that communicate with the VR interface. So the human worker can visualize construction site conditions in real time with VR. And also the robot operating system that controls the robot is also connected to the VR interface. So the robot movement and the robot inner status, like whether it can plan the task successfully, is also sent to the VR interface. So the human can know that. Through the interface, the human can interact with the robot and send high level commands and supervise the robot working status. For example, after the robot develop a detailed, motion, um, a detailed movement trajectory, uh, the human can preview simulated robot movement in VR just like animation and either decline or approve the movement to ensure safe operation before the robot actually start to move on construction site because the construction site might be very complex and if the robot climbs with, uh, with the structures on site, it might be very dangerous. My current goal is to use deep learning and reinforcement learning technologies to make the robot smarter when interacting with the human. Like just like a smarter assistance that can understand human intention better and also be able to conduct more, uh, conduct more tasks with fewer human commands. With the robot assistance, I believe construction industry will be more inclusive. People don't, don't need to be super powerful to work on construction site and even uh, and women, uh, there will be more women worker on construction site and even people with disabilities can also be construction workers. So uh, this is about my research and I would like to thank the uh, Barber Scholarship for uh, to support me for making all my research 
uh, to reach this place. And I would like to hand over, uh, hand it back to the uh, host. Oh, it's Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. Thanks very much, Xi. Um, and thanks to all the Barber scholars for their wonderful presentations. Um, I am just always amazed at the breadth and um, variety and um, amazing research. Weren't they just great? Um, I hope that you noticed that many of our Barber scholars are wearing pins today that are similar to the image that's um, on the right hand side of each of the scholars. And I just wanted to let you know that um, this was a pin that we had recreated. We believe that the pin was likely presented to scholars in the 20s and 30s. And we found an original in the Barber records at the university's Bentley Historical Library and used it to make a model of the modern pin that our scholars are wearing today. Um, and every time we have new scholars, we present them with the pins, as well as to Barber alumni. And if we have any alumni on the call tonight that don't have a pin, please let us know and we'll make sure you get one. We hope that each of you that have joined the uh, group of Barber scholars will wear your pins with pride and as a symbol of the part you play in the tremendous Barber legacy at Michigan. And so now we're um, going to go into some breakout rooms. So Anne Loeffler will be moving each of us into a room so that you can briefly congratulate and talk with our scholars and one another. We've done our very best to place um, each of the scholars guests into the right room. If you end up in a breakout room and you think you're in the wrong place, exit the room and Anne will help you. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Anne. But it was really nice to be in a smaller group and be able to talk and especially to people, some of whom are very far away. Um, I was in a, a room with people from Japan, Australia and LA. Um, so uh, we just have a couple more minutes, but I will um, open up the chat or the floor to anybody that wants to maybe share a comment about the discussion in their breakout room. I'll say a quick thing. Um, I was in a room with um, Sija, is in, saying that correctly? Um, mm -hmm. And she said that um, she always had all these different questions that she was curious about. And through her research, she found ways to bring them all together, even though they were very kind of diverse. And that is something she really loved about, about the research she's been able to do at Michigan. Uh, Chris says, Charmy's family has watched her fall in love with many animals and they congratulate her and her curiosity and adventurous spirit. All right, any other last comments from the group? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. I was in the robot room. We were talking with Shi Wang and uh, it was actually a very technical dis uh, discussion, uh, thinking about what's gonna happen next and about dust and safety and digital twin models. And we went right up to the last second, couldn't even get our last words in before we came back. So it was really very, very uh, fun, uh, engaging discussion. Thank you. Um, well, I, uh, for some of us were ready to embark on our day and others of us were ready to wrap up the day. And then there's others of us who it's the middle of the night. So I do especially wanna thank everybody who adjusted their schedule to be with us today for this wonderful celebration. Um, and um, it is very clear from hearing the presentations this evening that the women who join the Barber community um, are, are really outstanding students and accomplished young scholars and they hold great promise for all of us. And so on behalf of everybody here tonight in the Rackham Graduate School, I congratulate all of you and your families, advisors, and friends, and um, look forward to remaining in touch and having you be part of the Barber community 
and um, we wish you the best of success as you finish up your uh, work and complete your dissertations and defend and look forward to greeting you next year as alumni of the university. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful evening.